Well, I was asking, uh, I asked Dewey and I asked Clyde if they could remember this. And I don't know if anyone else could remember this, but in the, uh, well, none of us were in the Depression generation, but our parents and grandparents were. And in the Depression generation, they never threw anything away because they might need that for something. And one of the things they never threw away, you know, when you went to the store back in those days, I can even remember when I was a little kid going to the shoe store, and they got wrapped up all the shoes, because my dad would buy me a couple pairs of shoes and maybe some galoshes or something, and they wrapped it up in paper and they put string around that. The stores all had like a cone-shaped thing of string and went up over and so you brought those home, but in the Depression generation, they saved all that string. And those were string, they wound them up into a ball. They were string balls. Did you ever hear that? Dewey could remember those. And I can remember hearing about them, but they didn't throw anything away in those days. And I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning the other day and wrote a poem about a string ball. And I thought, why did God give me this poem about the string ball? But then I was struggling with my sermon, and it sort of it related to the sermon. So here is my poem. And I read this poem to one of the nurses of where my, where my wife is, and uh, she got choked up because she could remember the string ball that her grandfather had. And she was going to go try to find that. And uh, so I gave her a copy of this. But this is my poem entitled, The Ball of String. If I was a ball of string, you know, that useless thing, a ball made of string, I would be a wound up thing, round and tight, with all kinds of string. String from the store and so much more, chenille and yarn, colorful and bright, cotton, nylon, wool and the like. You know, that useless thing, that ball of string, that ball made of string. You wouldn't talk to me, a ball of string, there are no ears on this useless thing, this ball made of string. Oh, you could say some silly thing like, how are you, ball of string? I couldn't tell you, even if I knew. There's no way that I can say anything with no mouth. I'm only string. You know, that useless thing, that ball of string, that ball made of string. If I was a ball of string and you put me on the floor, the cat would play me till I'm a ball no more. Then I'd be a pile of string, useless, all over the floor. So give the cat something else to play, and in the form of a ball, I'll stay. You know, that useless thing, that ball of string, that ball made of string. If I was a ball of string, I'd not be able to move around. No legs on string can ever be found. Wherever I'm left, there I'd stay. For me to move, there's no way, in a box, a basket, or a drawer somewhere, till you move me, I'll be there, you know, that useless thing, that ball of string, that ball made of string. You don't see many such balls anymore. You can't find a string ball down at the store. Today's generations don't save at all the bits of string that could be a ball. I guess it's just a modern thing that we don't need balls of string. Into a museum you should go to see things from long ago. Maybe they'll have there on display a ball of string from yesterday, a silly thing, that ball of string. You know, that useless thing, that ball of string, that ball made of string. So I wrote that in the middle of the night. I'm not a poet. Poems don't come to me. I'm not a poet. I wrote a poem. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't realize that a ball of string could possibly have anything to do with the gospel. And then I realized that some things are important to some people at some time, are not important to other people at other times. That's the culture that we live in and that sort of evolves. The ball of string was important to the Depression generation. They didn't throw anything away. My mother used to save bread wrappers, and because it was, I'm talking before there were baggies, save bread wrappers and use that to put stuff in, you know. 
They didn't throw anything away because they didn't know if they'd get anything else. So, anyway, they didn't throw anything away. What we think of as mundane was precious to other generations going by. Our grandparents' generation. In some cases, parents' generation. So some people have that attitude toward the gospel. The generations are moving farther away from God. Like a ball of string, the gospel seems to be of no use to some. To many, uh, church, faith, and the gospel was once a, an important part of life. You know, the, the communities all had churches and the churches were full of people. The clergy was once a respected part of the community. You know, they used to have, and I can remember this, they used to always have a minister or a priest come to graduations and have an invocation. They don't do that anymore. They haven't done that for, I don't know how long. I can remember being at graduations, though, as a photographer, and, and there were always ministers there, but not anymore. So people are becoming indifferent to organized religion. Some people are going through the motions in church. But there's no real commitment to the things of God in a lot of people that go to church. But, um, you know, they, they need a church, they need a pastor when there's a wedding or when there's a funeral. But in everyday life, God is left out. And there are people around you like that, all over. Some people think the Bible is myth and lore. You know, like a ball of string. They don't need that anymore. Hey, there's a poem coming right there. Some people think the word doesn't apply to nowadays, to their heart. But we know that God's word is holy and true. We know that it's the truth that makes us free. Jesus was concerned that then, just as now, people would hear the truth and see the truth, but for some the truth didn't penetrate past the hearing. It didn't penetrate into the heart. It didn't penetrate into the spirit and make them whole. John 8, 31 and 32, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and that truth will set you free. If you hold to my teaching. People don't hold to their teaching any more than they hold to a ball of string anymore. They think it's irrelevant, why should we save string and why should we read the Bible? That's where we are in the culture today. And then they don't know the truth that they do not, and are not set free. Well, you know the story that Jesus told, this parable that he told about the farmer sowing seed of different, on different kinds of ground. And it's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's not found in John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels because it means that they look alike. They're very much alike, and John's is different. But anyway, this is known as the parable of the sower of Matthew 13. 3 to 9, I'm reading for the NIV. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, but uh, because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Now I know, that you have all heard that story, that you know that story, that you understand that story. But what I want to share with you today is the reason Jesus spoke in parables. Because the disciples asked him after that, why do you speak to the crowd 
in parables. Why do you speak it that way? And here was his answer in verse 13 to 17. And Jesus said, this is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. And I think right there he's talking about healing from the sickness of sin. I believe that's what he's talking about when he says I would heal them. Verse 16, but blessed are your eyes because they see, and yours because they hear. And he was referring to those who were his disciples who had accepted him as their Savior. For truly I tell you, in verse 17, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Observe here the enormous difference between the disciples and everyone else. There were in this parable three types of ground that would not produce a crop. Only one out of four would produce a crop. The disciples, including you and me, including us, were one in four in the parable. The parables were, parable, were um, parallels uh, between practical life truths and a spiritual lesson. <clears throat> People could understand the agricultural lesson. It was an object lesson. They could relate to that because it was an agricultural economy. And they were talking about seeds and planting, and people could all relate to that because they were still pretty much uh, what you call what you call agronomic. And the hearing and understanding in verse 13 is what Jesus wanted for his listeners. He would have preferred that all of them heard and understood, just as we would like everyone to hear and understand. And understanding, I mean, that they would take it into their heart and act on it. He knew that the truth that he preached would not be understood without a practical parallel. The seeing and the hearing are the ways in which the truth of the gospel comes to the sinner. It just doesn't come out of the air. They hear it or they see it or they read it, and that is seeing. The truth comes through hearing the witness of the believer. A preacher is only a witness. We believers are all to be witnesses. We have seen, we have heard, we have understood, we have believed and we have received and we know the truth. We have it. We possess the truth. Speaking of being witnesses and carrying the truth. I was in a shop the other day, and the owner of this shop uh, was a man who I counseled with and brought him to acknowledge that uh, of save, saved him, saved him. And there was another fellow in the store, and he introduced me to the guy, and he said, this is the man that saved my soul. And I said, no, Jesus saved your soul. I just witnessed, I was just the messenger boy that brought that good news to you. Because he had told me, he says, I know I'm not going to be in heaven. This was a couple of years ago, three or four years, maybe two or three years ago. And I counseled with him, I said, you can't, because, because of something he had done. I said, you can't decide who God forgives. You can't decide what, who, who God's gift <coughs> is applied to. You can't do that. And I counseled with him, and I prayed with him, and uh, I baptized him uh, sometime after that. But I was just a messenger boy. 
just the witness. Preacher is only a witness. And so are the rest of us, you know, we're just witnesses. In the parable of the sower, three quarters of the seed would not succeed. Only a quarter would fall in fertile soil. God wants the sinner to repent and come into the family. In this church, we are of open eye, open arms to people who come in. I pray that God will send them. But once in a while, he sends one. But sadly, there are those who refuse to believe. Actually, most people, actually, will not believe. I can remember refusing to believe. I can remember, not literally, but figuratively putting my hand out and saying, I don't want to hear that. I can remember not literally, but figuratively turn my back on God and say, I don't need this influence in my life. I can remember being that hard-hearted. Most will not believe. Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Only a few. That's a tragedy. A tragedy. Only a few find it. You are numbered among that few. Jesus had compassion on them all. He spoke to them in parallels to help them understand and accept his truth. He brought the gospel to their level. The people, the sinners, could relate to that lesson. That doesn't mean they accepted it. But when we bring the truth to someone, Personally, when we witness, we tell about what God has done for us personally. Your witness is powerful. Because it's dramatic the change that comes over you when you get saved. And when you share how that is with people, that penetrates more than if you um, were talking theology to them. They're going to shrug their shoulders and go away. But if you talk your experience with God and bring scriptures into it, that's powerful. That's your witness. Because people can relate to your experience. Human beings can relate to other human beings' experiences. We can all relate because we've been all fallen around this week or two. We've all had those experiences. What God has done in your life, how how you came to Christ, what he has done years ago, what he has done yesterday in your life, what he's doing today, sharing what your Christian walk is like, what God has done and continues to do in your life, the big things, the little things. You recognize that God has a hand in your life and you share those experiences with people. You know, our experiences are real. People are fascinated with other people's lives. That's why you have reality TV shows that are so popular. Because they're fascinated with how somebody else lives and does and copes and, you know. Sharing your faith walk and not theology, but down to earth what God can do in a life is attractive to those who are in darkness. God healed me. When I was 14 years old, I got rheumatoid arthritis. There's no cure for that. It's a crippling disease. I went to school on crutches sometimes. But I don't have rheumatoid arthritis. It's gone. I had it every joint in my body, even my jaws I had it in. I don't have it. It's gone. The last flare-up I had, I was 20 years old. And I wasn't a believer then. But my mother was. So I have to say that I was healed on credit <laughs> because I would be a believer one day and give God the glory for that. I've had raging psoriasis. Had it on here, peeling, flaking, itchy stuff. And on my knee, on my toes, on my ankles, behind this ear, on my elbows. I don't have a speck of it. 
Praise God. I'm healed. Your Christian walk and what God has done in your life is like parables that Jesus used that people can relate to your life and your experiences, your trials, and how God has brought you through things. We who know and love the Bible can relate to the Word, but in the world, the world, the Word seems foolish. Oh, that old story, those old things, I'm not, I don't care about that. That's what the world thinks, but they can relate to your experiences with and from God. They can relate to that. That gets their attention. Then you can direct them to scriptures. In this, you know, Matthew 13, 15, it says, For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. So this description was prophesied in Isaiah. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Lord wants all people to come to repentance. He's not willing that any should perish. His desire is that every person would accept him as Lord and Savior, but the reality is, what he said himself was, that only a few find it. Only a few. He knew that many would not understand and be healed, meaning saved. So he brought the message down to their level with parables, hoping that someone would really be able to relate to that. Today's people don't make string balls anymore. Nobody writes with an ink pen anymore. I can remember ink in bottles. Some of you can remember that. Remember ink in bottles? You go down, buy a bottle of ink. Some of those little balls were 10 cents at the, at the dime store. And you had a dip pen because your ink pen, usually that bladder wore out because it was in there, so you used your pen. And we wrote letters. People don't write letters anymore. How many of you wrote a letter in the last year? Nobody. You did. Yep. You're an antique. Huh? <laughs> You're an antique. <laughs> <laughs> yep. People don't write letters anymore. People used to write <clears throat> back and forth all the time. Now it's email. You don't need to write letters. They don't teach kids to write cursive anymore. You know that? It's not, it's, it's, old, it's not necessary. I can write backwards in cursive. I can't. But it's not necessary. You know who wrote backwards? Michelangelo. Because he didn't want people to be able to read his notes. So he wrote backwards. I thought, well, if Michelangelo could do it. I tried it, I practiced it, I can actually do it. I can actually write backwards. And that's a worthless thing, just like a string ball. I, they don't teach children cursive, they don't make buggy whips anymore. Used to be, you know, people made a living making buggy whips. Only the Amish use them now. The culture changes. People in my generation have seen big changes. Some really great changes and some not so great, but they're all big. You know, we can remember when there were no computers. There were no such thing as computers. Can you remember that? There was a computer in New York City. I forget, it had a, it had a name. It was a Univac. Am I right? Remembering that? That thing was a huge, and they had a building built around it and it wouldn't do what your phone will do. And there was no screen, just paper came out of it with data. And now your phone will outperform that huge computer. Things change in the culture. We can remember when there were no satellites in the sky. Can you remember the first satellite that went up there? I can remember before the, there were no satellites in the sky, now they're all over the place. Today's people don't think they hate God's word anymore. They think it's as obsolete as a string ball. Many think that the Bible is obsolete, that it's irrelevant to their lives, like a ball of string, that useless thing. The difference is that Psalm 
119.89, your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. In the King James, it's forever settled in heaven. The word is very different from what is uh, said to be in the world. The world and the word are two different things. God's word is not like a string ball, ink pens, carburetors, or anything else of human origin that comes and goes. Not like any of those things. Jesus encountered resistance to the word. So he spoke in parables, hoping that that would overcome the resistance of some of them because they could relate to it. The resistance has always been there. It comes from the enemy. There's nothing new about that. Isaiah prophesied about seeing and hearing, but not understanding. The word has to get past the ears. There are people that, <clears throat> that know a little snippet of the Bible. Psalm 23, you know, different things like that. <clears throat> but it just comes to their ears. It doesn't come into their spirit. If they resist it. So it doesn't force on anybody. It doesn't force. The word comes. If they reject it, it just rolls off of them. They hear it, but it doesn't get past their ears or their eyes and down into their heart where it needs to be. Can you relate to that? I can. I can remember when I, I was reading the Bible, but I wasn't believing it. When I was at Penn State, a, a student at Penn State I asked my mother for a Bible. I went down to the bookstore, she bought me a Bible. I started reading it, but it was just my eyes and my ears. I didn't I didn't bring it down into my heart. I just wanted to know what was in there. But the word will not return void. A few years later, I got saved. But it has to get past the eyes and the ears. That's why Jesus used parables. That's why we need to use our own experiences. Because people will be fascinated with what's happening in your life. The resistance is hard. It was hard for Jesus even with the parables. But the word is powerful. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The resistance is from the wiles of the enemy. 2 Corinthians 10, for the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So Jesus spoke in parables to aid understanding. We speak in witnessing about our own experiences with God to aid in understanding. Our friends and neighbors can identify with our salvation experience, our healing experience. Then hopefully the word will penetrate. Some of them will resist. Satan is the father of the resistance. But some of them, there will be a change taking place in their spirit, their heart, because what they hear you saying that you have gone through what God has done for you. That penetrates. That penetrates. And then you just have to be armed with a few salvation scriptures and be able to lead someone to the Lord. It's, it's that simple. You could be a soul winner just by sharing how God has changed your life, how He has healed you, how you've seen Him do. There are miracles. There are. Our oldest, uh, youngest son was born with no connection between his colon and the, and the outside world. He had emergency surgery, and they did a colonoscopy. He exposed a scar right here. They brought that loop of bowel out there. And the next day, he had a mess in his diaper. 
which was impossible. There was no opening there. And they were going to just put that back in and close up the incision. And the surgeon noticed a spot of necrotic tissue on that intestine. So they had to open it. He had a colostomy bag with two stomas. And, and then when he got a little bit heavier, uh, just a few weeks later, they put that back together. It was a miracle. And the surgeon said, the most significant thing about this baby, and the nurse didn't tell me there was material in his diaper. She got in trouble with that. It was a miracle. God does miracles. Yeah. And people need to know that. People need to hear that God changes a life. They need to know what you were like before and what you were like now. They need, to, they need to hear and understand and know that. If you just if you just share theology with them, they're going to shrug their shoulders and walk away. I did. <clears throat> Maybe you did too. I don't know. But theology comes after salvation. It, then it penetrates once you have a regenerated heart, a regenerated spirit. Then you, then you, I can remember when I got saved, I devoured the word. I read the Bible from start to, to end. Every day I'd read it for an hour or so, and I'd read the whole thing, just wolfed it down. Wolfed it down. And I started a few years ago reading it annually. Um, this year I'm reading it for the 28th time. Uh -huh, I recommend that you do that. Yeah. Uh, would you stand with me? I don't think it's... There's no snow yet. So we'll get down to here ahead of that. And uh, the snow, we were supposed to get maybe an inch down at home, but up here was a little more called for. So... We're letting you get out of here ahead of time. Wouldn't this be a nice place for to ride a sled out here? We used to we used to do that. We had sled riding. Or have some of those uh, half moons out there a little bit out in uh, Russia for kids. Or all. I don't know. If, I don't know if these two youngins over here would do that. For these three youngins. We have our own hill. Yeah, hill. Yeah, we're your own hill. Yeah, I'll do here, Jason and him. Oh, yeah? I used to think when we had quite a few children here that we'd need to have a snow day. And uh, we'd have to hot chocolate going and chili and stuff inside there, you know, so that we could stay in when we're out there. <laughs> and it's freezing cold. But sometimes it's too cold to sleep. It's too cold. Maybe in March we can have a kite flying day. What do you think? Is that too old fashioned? It's windy in March. Anyway, dear Lord, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to share these morsels from your word. And we pray that they take root, that we will become more, uh, more concerned about the lost around us and be able to share our own experiences because that will get their attention and then uh, be able to bring them to the Lord. And then bring them in here. And uh, we pray for this church, Lord, and pray for this country, Lord, because we're on a collision course with you, this country is, and we just pray that uh, the Holy Spirit will come and bring conviction to the people, the leaders of this nation, Lord. We pray for that in Jesus' name. And I believe there are people all over, Christian believers all over, praying for the same thing daily as I do. And Lord, we pray for everybody in here today, Lord, that they all have a safe uh, drive home and that they all be able to stay warm in these cold days, Lord. So we ask you to be with us all uh, and keep us all safe, Lord, until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey.